Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now let us see uh, through a couple of arguments that how we can debate on the controversies of how observations presuppose theory or observations are very pure or observations are not theory laden uh, or whatever observation that we make today they are very much dependent on theory. It is not simply that uh, uh, whatever observation that we make is absolutely pure, okay. whatever observation that we make, okay, how it is uh, also mediated by so many other factors. Okay. That is why we, we used the term uh, 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 perspectives uh, in, at the very beginning that uh, a perspective refers to a set of symbols which human beings use to select from all potentially observable aspects of nature. Select whenever I talk about perspective at least three things come to my mind. One is selection and the way we organize our perceptions and the process of selection and organization of perceptions they lead us uh, or they guide our actions. Okay. In this sense we are using perspective and, uh, and what kind of uh, uh, perspective that we are going to have or, or, uh, or, or the kind of observation that we make are they independent of any kind of perspective, are they so pure are they so indubitable that they are absolutely independent of uh, uh, theory. In this context we are going to have a section on observations presupposed theory. How? First let us see observations presuppose some principle of selection. Selection is very important that is why uh, in perspective we used the first thing that we do not take anything and everything we tend to select something okay we cannot that's why i said observations presuppose some principle of selection suppose this is a room okay this is a classroom if i ask all of you to observe somebody may say that no there are curtains somebody may say that no there is a uh, camera, there is a uh, projector, there is a computer, but I am sure not everybody will be able to capture all observations, all types of observations, all elements of observations. We cannot go on and on observing anything that we come across. In this sense, we make some kind of relevant observations as we feel. In science, it is the problem that decides what is relevant and thus provides the principle of selection. It is up to the, the individual, it is up to the, the research problem, okay. it is up to the research question, it is up to the objective of the study which determines what is relevant and what is not and thus and the, the what is being relevant leads us to uh, uh, the point of uh, principle of selection. Hence, there cannot be observations without a prior problem. To quote Karl Popper, 
Okay. We will we'll discuss Popper uh, a little while later in its entirety. <coughs> to, to quote Karl Popper what he said, before we can collect data, our interest in data of a certain kind must be aroused. The problem always comes fast. Suppose, in the inductivist schema, science always start with uh, science always starts with observation. In the hypothesis schema, science always starts with a hypothesis. In the positivistic schema, science always starts with observation. And in the Popperian schema, science always starts with a problem. Okay. It may be objected that the problem itself is due, is due to the observations that we make and hence observations come first, but this objection does not hold. Two persons might make similar observations though only one might only one might come out with a problem. This shows that mere observations will not generate a problem. How uh, then are scientific problems generated? It is important to know if two or more people make similar kind of observations and only one person comes out with a problem and other the other person or persons they cannot, then how then are scientific problems generated? It is usually when there is a class between what we observe and what we expect. Of the two persons making similar observations, one may come out with a problem, whereas the other may not because the former has expectations which conflict with the observations that she or he makes, whereas the latter does not have any expectation or rather the latter has expectations which coincide with the kind of observations that he or she makes. The expectations are generated due to our uh, due to our belief in a theory. Thus, problem generation presupposes a prior theoretical commitment. In other words, a prior belief in a theory is necessary for a problem to be generated and a prior awareness of the problem is necessary for making relevant observations. That is why I, as I gave you the example that suppose I will say uh, that uh, my expectation is not to see a ghost, but I am observing a ghost, then I have a problem, then I create a problem, I, I create a research question that no ghosts were a part of that theological stage, not a positivistic stage, not a scientific stage. But if my expectation and my observation they coincide, okay, then there is no emergence of a research question. But if my expectation deviates from my from the way I make observation, then I tend to come out with a research question. Secondly, in science observations are taken into account only if they are desirable in a language that is currently used in a particular science. An observation which howsoever genuine cannot be expressed in the recognized idiom for all scientific processes or purposes is no observation at all. I repeat an observation which howsoever genuine cannot be expressed in the recognized idiom for all scientific purposes is no observation at all. It is the theory which provides the language or the idiom to be used in describing observations. It is tempting to quote in this connection the words of the physicist and philosopher Duham, Pierre Duham. Okay. And, and just let me quote uh, Peter Duham uh, the way he, uh, uh, he tried to capture this, the spirit of this study. Enter a laboratory, approach the, the table crowded with an 
assortment of apparatus and electric cell, silk covered copper ware, small cups of mercury, spools, a mirror mounted on an iron bar. The experimenter is inserting into small openings the metal ends of uh, ebony uh, headed pins, the, the iron bar oscillates and the mirror attached to it throws a luminous band upon a uh, celluloid scale. The forward backward motion of this spot enables the physicist to observe the minute oscillations of the iron bar. But ask him or her what C or he is doing. Will C or he answer I am studying the oscillations of an iron bar which carries a mirror? No. C or he will say that C or he is measuring the electrical resistance of the spools. That is why theory provides you with a language or an idiom. If you are astonished, if you ask him or her what her or his words mean, what relation they have with the phenomenon C or he has been observing for a long period of time okay, uh, and which you have noted at the same time as C or he will answer that your question requires a long explanation and that you should take a course in electricity. I mean again theory, you come back to theory, I mean observations become, uh, become null and void because observations do not give you a language or idiom uh, uh, for expression. Okay. Thirdly, most of the observations in science made with the help of instruments are constructed or designed in accordance with the specifications provided by some theories. And these theories one may say constitute the software of these instruments. Belief in the reliability of these instruments implies the acceptance of these theories which have gone into the making of these instruments. Thus, observations presuppose prior theoretical commitment. Okay. First, we objected uh, 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 how observations, I mean observations presuppose theory, how we made objections to this to such statement that first we said observations are not pure or indubitable okay, because of uh, prior theoretical commitments. Secondly, we suggested that observations do not have a language or idiom to express whereas, theories have okay. uh, and thirdly we said that uh, that observations always pre presuppose prior theoretical commitments. Fourthly observations in science need to be legitimized or ratified by a theory. We all know that Galileo used some telescopic uh, observations to support his theory. His opponents did not consider telescopic observations accurate. It is not that they did not believe in the reliability of telescope. They had no problem in using telescope for terrestrial uh, of the earth purposes. Okay. They opposed its extension to terrestrial or heavenly, uh, uh, I mean celestial or heavenly uh, sphere where things like background, neighborhood, possibility of verification which are usually found in the normal instances of perception are absent. They rightly demanded from Galileo a theory of optics which would justify the extension of the use of telescope from terrestrial to celestial sphere. Galileo had no such theory, but he rightly believed that in future such a theory could be formulated. Thus, Galileo believed that it was possible to justify the type of observations on which he was dependent. This instance, if you look at this instance, uh, brings out how observations need ratification or justification in terms of either an actual or possible theory. In this sense, too, our observations are theory laden, okay? our observations are not pure or indubitable. All this does not imply that observations are theory dependent, whereas theories are observation independent. Earlier we 
knew that observations are theory independent, whereas theories are observation dependent. Now, uh, 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 now these three, four points that we have made that um, observations are theory dependent, whereas theories are observation independent. Okay. Theories and observations depend on each other. Let me tell you that how all this now implies that positivists were wrong in claiming that observations are theory independent. One just cannot leave either of the two observation or theory to, to come to a conclusion. Okay? Whereas, whereas each the proponents of each school of thought they went ahead with propounding for either observation or theory. Okay? Thus, no observation is presuppositionless as positivist thought and observation is not a passive reception, uh, 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 passive reception constitutes uh, the beginning of knowledge, but involves the active participation of our cognitive faculties characterized by purposiveness, I mean instrumental character, demonstrative character which we discussed earlier uh, uh, prior knowledge and expectations. After all, observations are not given, but are made. When I said observations are not given, but are made, that is why observations are not pure, observations are not indubitable uh, as positivists argued, uh, rather positivist uh, uh, rather observations are always made, observations always emanate from uh, some amount of selection, some amount of perspective some amount of theory articulation. And, and when I said no observation is presuppositionless okay, as positivists thought because just because our observation we what whatever observations that we make they must have some kind of uh, theories to back uh, uh, they must have some expectation uh, 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 to be met with uh, they must have some objective to make with uh, to be met with uh, uh, and so on. Okay. What will what what have we discussed till now? Let us see. Okay. If we look at I mean uh, last week what we did we discussed uh, uh, the ontological questions okay, uh, uh, concerning the relationship between science, technology and society technological determinism, what kind of problems we, we are going to face if we subscribe to the idea of technological determinism, then whether technology is neutral or not, how it how the neutrality of technology uh, is very much contingent upon uh, the ways a particular technology is designed and controlled, then what are the implications of uh, uh, such uh, 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 such phenomenon on our uh, economy, polity, and culture. Okay, two profoundly destabilizing changes uh, that we very often uh, witness in the form of cognitive and political. Okay, I mean when I say political, I mean territoriality, nation states, the question of citizenship, and so on. I mean a right to food. A right, a freedom of expression, a right to, I mean accessibility, uh, or the questions of democracy, uh, freedom to dissent and so on. And when I, when I when, uh, and then from these ontological questions we move to the more normative structure of science propounded by Robert Merton, one of the proponents of sociology of science and technology perspective in the 1930s and 1940s. He used his functionalist approach to uh, 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 describe uh, the, the ethos of science, the normative structure of science. Okay. Then he, he discussed the goal of science as, a, as, the ex, as an extension of certified knowledge, uh, the imperatives of science which, uh, which, which consist of both goal as well as uh, the methods, technical methods. 
okay? I mean empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities and from there on we have moved to the, the four institutional imperatives, four uh, institutional ethos of modern science namely universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. Okay? In the last week we discussed this. This week what we have discussed? This week we have discussed partly the, the I mean we started with methods of science and we have tried to uh, cover three important methods of science. I mean two important methods uh, of science uh, so far as the pre 20th century is concerned and one important method of science so far as the 20th century is concerned. Okay? Pre 20th century I mean inductivism and hypothesism and uh, uh, 20th century I mean I mean positivism. If you look at these aspects then what we find is that that uh, uh, we have discussed uh, how inductivism uh, uh, suggests that the method of science is the method of induction, how hypothesism suggests that no the method of science is not the method of induction, but the method of hypothesis inductivism the way uh, it was propounded by Francis Bacon and hypothesism by Descartes perhaps for this reason. Uh, uh, inductivism is also known as the Baconian model of science and hypothesis is also known as the Cartesian model of science. Okay? Uh, uh, inductivism is rooted in empiricism, empiricism is rooted in experience uh, according to which only those ideas which are traceable to sense experience are legitimate. Then we discussed how hypothesis is grounded in rationalism, rationalism is rooted in uh, reason reasoning capacity according to which a significant portion of human knowledge cannot be traced to and therefore, is independent of sense experience. And then we discussed how uh, inductivism uh, in the inductivist schema science starts with observations, remains at the level of observations and ends with observations. Whereas, in the hypothesis schema science begins only when it goes beyond observations. That is why the whereas, uh, the hallmarks of science in the inductivist schema uh, are uh, certainty and breadth uh, in the uh, context of hypothesis schema uh, the hallmarks of scientific knowledge are novelty and depth. Okay? Uh, in this sense uh, 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 I mean how uh, uh, inductivists did not believe in uh, uh, whatever is unobservable even if the, the uh, I mean unobservable they did not believe in any theoretical terms like electron, proton etcetera, uh, but hypothesis always believed in the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, no uh, we must start with a hypothesis uh, and so on and uh, uh, they tried to look at the real entities and processes uh, involving the unobservable phenomena that is why. Uh, uh, um, uh, hypothesists are called realists, whereas inductivists are called um, uh, uh, anti-realists. Okay? Uh, I mean, uh, this is what we we discussed, and then how inductivists and hypothesists they they uh, they prepared grounds so that two rival methodologies can go by uh, go side by side each had their own proponents among both scientists as well as philosophers and then in the 20th century okay, what we see uh, uh, the, the, the emergence of positivism as I said uh, positivism is a stage in the development of society which has made a transition uh, uh, to come to this stage having overcome the stages of theology as well as metaphysics. Okay? And then we have discussed uh, 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 the central tenets of positivism in the sense of methodological I mean that the that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity because it possesses a method unique to it in terms of methodological monism that 
and there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter then inductivism that the method of science is the method of induction then systematic verifiability that the hallmark of science consists in the fact that that um, all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable. Uh, then we discussed uh, how observations uh, in the positivistic schema are considered pure in a in the sense that observations lead to theory, but, but the converse is not true. I mean the unilateral relationship between observation and theory observations are pure that is why they cannot be doubted such indubitability the aspect of indubitability was attributed to uh, observations or facts uh, uh, that is why the uh, positivists tried to look at a dichotomy between uh, uh, fact and value um, uh, facts are value neutral whereas, values do not have any factual content uh, all scientific explanation uh, must involve deduction. I mean starting from a set of laws uh, followed by a set of uh, initial set of statements describing initial conditions and the conclusion that we make out of a set of laws as well as a set of statements describing initial conditions okay? uh, a set of the, the conclusion is in the form of a, a statement describing the phenomenon to be explained. And if any scientific explanation does not follow this pattern then it is not considered valid or uh, legitimate and is subject to deductive nomology. Okay? And then we, the way we discussed uh, that, how, that on what count there were critics to positivistic schema about scientific knowledge production uh, in the form of observations presuppose theory. And then we saw uh, on four counts okay, uh, that uh, uh, we, we came to know that no observations, uh, uh, no observation is presuppositionless as positivists thought, uh, observations uh, always presuppose some amount of some element of selection. Observations are not theory independent rather uh, observations are theory laden. Okay? What we will do, what we will do in the in the next week that we will start with again with these four points slowly and, uh, and quickly uh, rather quickly uh, and then we will move on to how Karl Popper, how Karl Popper an eminent uh, philosopher of science, historian of science, how he tried to dwell upon uh, uh, the methods of science by by challenging positivism okay uh, and then we move we'll move on to thomas kuhn's the structure of scientific revolutions and then paul farabend's against method okay thank you Thanks.